Hello and welcome to the Print Soft Cover. I am Purva Chitnis. Uh, I'm the principal correspondent with the Print. Uh, today we will be talking about a book called On Gujarmal Modi. It's a biography uh, written by Sonu Bhaseen. And this book is basically, it's a biography which tells about the legend uh, Gujar, Gujarmal Modi, who is also the father of manufacturing. And he is the one, in fact, who saw, who converted, in fact, an adversity into an opportunity. And then the rest is the history. We will get to that in just a bit. But about the author, uh, Sonu Bhaseen, she is uh, one of the early women professionals in the corporate world. And she has also worked in large corporates like the Axis Bank, uh, Tata Capital, Yes Bank. And uh, she's also a uh, business historian, a business author. And uh, she's also, in fact, the founder of Families and Business. Uh, welcome, Sonu, uh, on the soft cover. And uh, she, in fact, has written this book, which I will just uh, unwrap it for our viewers. So this is this book. Uh, it's Entrepreneurs Who Built India, Gujarmal Modi. And this is the first in the series that uh, Sonu has written uh, in the series of Entrepreneurs Who Built India. So uh, let's just start uh, discussing this book, uh, Sonu. This is, in fact, a book by HarperCollins Publication, and it is about 260 pages uh, book. Uh, it's a very uh, inspiring book, in fact, Sonu, that you've written. And uh, for anyone who wants to even start a business, this could be a great learning. But uh, before we begin, I just like, you know, want to understand uh, why Guzarman Modi? Why did you uh, think that you want to start off with him? Yeah. So, Purva, uh, before anything else, let me just say how, uh, you know, it's such a pleasure to be talking to you on the platform of the print. Uh, it's a wonderful platform and I'm really honored to be part of it. Uh, coming to why Gujarmal Modi as one of the, as the first in the series of entrepreneurs who built India. So as you mentioned in your introduction, I do now work in the area of family businesses, more on the family side, less on the business. I help family businesses work out, understand their family strategy, like they have a business strategy. Uh, it's essential for them to have a family strategy. And therefore, my writings now are about families, family businesses and promoters. Uh, so when HarperCollins, uh, Sachin Sharma, who is the executive editor at HarperCollins and I, we were discussing some ideas for books. Uh, you know, he suggested uh, that we look at entrepreneurs who are kind of forgotten now entrepreneurs who yeah. built India because today when we talk about entrepreneurs we talk about promoters we talk about industrialists we talk about people who are successful today yeah. um, we kind of forget that there was a whole bunch of entrepreneurs promoters who worked in pre-independent India and pre-liberalized India against a host of odds and you know the the foundation that is laid by them has enabled the promoters the the startups the industrialists of today to build on and then be successful not only in india but around the world and you know once we did say that you know this is a nice uh, set of people that we would like to talk about and bring back to the public memory actually uh, Sachin and I couldn't think of anyone better than Gujarat Malmodi because he was the sixth largest or the seventh largest industrialist, you know, when India became yeah. independent. But today, if you ask a random man or a woman on the street and say Gujarat Malmodi, they'll give you a blank look. Uh, yeah. And, you know, if you then say, do you know Lalit Modi of IPL? Yeah. And they'll say, yeah, of course. So, you know, Gujarmal Modi is, was the, or Lalit, Lalit Modi is the grandson of Gujarmal Modi and he's better known than his grandfather who was, you know, the sixth largest and an incredible industrialist of his times. Um, and, you know, he's not alone. There are many, many, many industrialists and promoters who were successful then but have forgotten and we can go into the reasons why as we talk further. Um, and, you know, Gujarmal Modi also has a town named after him. 
uh, yeah. which again is just a handful of people who have that honor. Um, mm. So therefore, we said let's kick, start the series with Gujar Mal Modi, and I'm really happy that we did because the response is really fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, if we talk about him, uh, the very first, uh, you know, at the introduction itself, uh, uh, there is this whole uh, incident about uh, how he started his business. Uh, I would let you talk about that incident, but it was, in fact, uh, an opportunity that he saw in adversity. If you could uh, tell our viewers what that incident was. Yeah. So, you know, Gujar Mal Modi did not come from a humble background. He actually came yeah. from quite a racy background. His grandfather and father were a large businessman in Patiala and, you know, in pre-independent India, you know, going all the way to Lahore and, uh, and you know, Amritsar and large chunks of North India. So he grew up in a privileged uh, household. Uh, he had a business of his father that he could have carried on. Uh, but he, you know, the, the ambition in him ran, uh, ran very high right from childhood. And yeah. therefore, he always wanted to expand the horizon. I mean, in Patiala, of course, he was working with his father, but he wanted to move beyond Patiala. He wanted to establish a footprint outside Patiala. But, you know, like all fathers, uh, his father said, no, beta, stay in Patiala, you know, you've got this business, Tumare liye hai, tum please is pe kaam karo. you know, what is the need for you to go out? So like a dutiful son, he did listen to his dad, but his heart was really in doing something larger, grander and something that he could call his own. And hmm. then came an opportunity in 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 way of an uh, uh, a banishment. So you know, in those days there were these riyasats. So Patiala was a riyasat, and the the Maharaja of Patiala uh, was was like a large man with expensive tastes, and you know his his stories are well known. Uh, Gujar Mal Modi had been brought up in a household that was purely vegetarian and a complete teetotaler. And he would not even touch a drop of wine. And, uh, you know, once there was a, uh, okay, celebratory occasion at the uh, Maharaja's palace, and Gujarmal was also there, and he was asked by the Maharaja to take a, you know, to celebrate, to say cheers, you know, uh, happy for you, etc. And he refused. And which was a big deal because nobody says no to the Maharaja. And so the Maharaja's Kutia has also kind of uh, instigated the Maharaja to say, Dekho, you know, he doesn't listen to you and he's a rebel and all of that. So at that time, they couldn't jail the people without a proper court case, etc. But they could banish people from their riyasat. So the Maharaja, ka to, I mean, he banished him, exiled him from the riyasat. This mm -hmm. actually was a godsend opportunity for uh, Gujar Mal Modi. Because now his father couldn't do anything. His father couldn't, you know, get him to stay in Patiala. Uh, huh. Though the father was sure that over a period of time, he could get the Maharaja to revoke his order. But Gujar Mal Modi, instead of, I mean, he was, of course, very, very humiliated and angry. But then when he realized that this was, this was actually an opportunity for him to get out of Patiala. Exactly. It with both his hands and he went and he established uh, and I'm cutting the story short but he established a sugar mill in a village near Mirat called Begamabad which then was the start of his industrial township that called that came to be called Modi Nagar. Right uh, but about his business like if we talk about his family business uh, his family business did not involve, uh, you know, uh, vanaspati and sugar mills and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, he uh, had interest in these areas. Uh, why do you think, like, you know, uh, is there any particular reason why he was interested in those particular areas and not wanted to continue uh, with his family business? So you know. Uh... As I do study and work with family businesses, I do see that, you know, there is merit in that, uh, you know, saying that we have in Hindi, ki, you know, business bachcho ko ghutti mein piece piece ke pilaya jata hai. So, you know, when you grow up in a household, which is business oriented, all talk at the dinner table is about business. You know, you do get an inherent sense of business inside you. 
And mm. then it is, of course, for each individual uh, to see, you know, what is their level of ambition? What is it that they want to achieve? Now, uh, from all records and all research that I have done, Bhujan Mal Modi had always been industrious. He had always been uh, uh, inquisitive and he did want to do things outside the shadow of his dad. So, you know, when you have a patriarch who's, a, who's, who's, who's successful, uh, uh, people tend to take the son, the inheritors of the businesses a little lightly till the patriarch is still alive. And for anyone who is ambitious, who is self-respecting, it kind of needles them and they do want to make their own mark. So he did try. He did try to set up a factory outside of Patiala for his uncle and then for himself. But his dad called him back. And you know, you know how dads are. I mean, we all do it with our children, emotionally blackmail them and, you know, make them stay at home. So he was emotionally blackmailed to stay at home and give up the factories that were there, that he was setting up, the Vanaspati factory that he was setting up. Um, but, you know, the other thing that rankled him was that um, the Riyasats ran on the whims and fancies of the uh, ruler. So Patiala, in this case, the Maharaja. And there were a couple of permissions or approvals that Gujarmal Modi wanted to set up new factories, a Vanaspati factory and a cloth factory, that at the last minute, uh, you know, the approval was withdrawn. So he, he also kind of felt quite uh, irritated that, you know, I am dependent on somebody else's whims and fancies to decide what to do. And that was one of the reasons he wanted to move out of uh, Patiala. He wanted to work in the area of Delhi, which was under British rule uh, and therefore, you know, uh, was a little more rule based uh, uh, and was a little more business friendly. So he had it in him. Uh, he always did want to get out. When he saw an opportunity, he did. So, uh, you know, speaking about expansion of his business from Begamba to uh, Modi Nagar, how was that journey? How difficult was it? Uh, because considering that was a pre-independent era and, uh, you know, there was, there, it was a very different kind of era. So how difficult was it to set up his business uh, outside his father's shadow in a completely different area? And uh, then, in, because uh, normally what the businessmen kind of build a conglomerate, but here we are talking about an industrial town which was built at that point of time. So how was it for him? So, you know, what I found fascinating as I did my research was that when most entrepreneurs or wannabe entrepreneurs want to set up their business, they all dream of a business empire. That exactly. I'll have a large empire, I'll have this business, I'll have that business, I'll make so much of money, I'll do this, I'll do that. But the starting ambition for Gujarmal Modi was to set up an industrial township. Oh, okay. uh, he walked, I mean, I don't think he was clear in his mind as to what were the industries that he wanted in the township. But he was clear that he wanted an industrial township. And that, uh, you know, according to me, my hypothesis is that that ambition uh, uh, was in him to set up a township because, you know, he'd seen the Maharaja run his Riyasat, you know, as a personal fiefdom, which of course it was. So he wanted something that he could call his own, but run it on more democratic, more egalitarian, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in uh, welfare of the people in that manner. So he, he, when he, uh, when he decided that he wanted to set up a sugar mill, he was clear that he wanted a space which had enough uh, area around it to expand into a township. So the journey, uh, uh, I mean, setting up a business at any point of time, whether then or now, is not easy. Uh, but back then it was even more difficult because you yeah. know we didn't have proper roads, there was no proper communication, there was no talent, there was you know the all logistics was a problem. But yeah. uh, he, I mean, he did set up I think a four and a half story sugar mill that people from you know villages far and wide came to just stand and look up with awe uh, because it was a grand structure. So it it wasn't an easy. Uh, journey 
but he did it because he was a man fired uh, by his ambition and how was it uh, post independence then so how yeah things changed for him um post independence i think there were, actually it had started happening even before india uh, formally became independent because there was the provisional okay. government i think 3 or 4 years before india actually uh, uh, got independent uh and uh and and you know the provisional government wanted to do things differently than the uh, what the britishers were doing and uh, uh again my research shows that gujar mal modi was kind of uh, taken aback at the uh, socialistic point of view of uh, the provisional government because he realized that this government is going to be the future government of india as and in when india does get her independence and so he was i mean and he was a very uh, outspoken man he he did uh, he did uh, tell the leaders and there is a story that is there in the book uh, that uh, when jawaharlal nehru uh, went to modi nagar for uh, for a, for i think a sabha uh, mm-hmm. he invited uh, gujar mal modi invited uh, the prime minister home uh, for tea and when when uh, jawaharlal nehru wasn't the pm he had been to gujar mal modi's house you know quite a few times but when he invited nehru home nehru said are you inviting the prime minister or are you inviting jawaharlal you know the person and he said i'm inviting you know the old jawaharlal nehru but because of you know whatever uh, protocol and all they could not go to the house so they went to this guest house near in muradnagar which is you know near a canal and again records show that uh, 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 jawaharlal nehru asked uh, told gujar mal modi that you know i am surprised that all you industrialists you you know my point of view about the industry and you know the role that i want the government to play in the industry and yet wherever i go you know i am fitted and i am celebrated and people come and you know they they want to meet with me so pooja mal modi the outspoken man he says you know uh, what you know uh, look at me i am not even a high school pass he wasn't he, he did not complete his high school he says i am not a, even a high school pass but look at me god has given me so much and i am now you know i run so many uh, factories i run so many businesses so surely there's something that i must have done in my previous life he was also a very religious man that uh, allows me to that allows me to lead this life so i am sure uh, mr prime minister that you must have also done something good in your previous life for you to get this uh, so you know it's not very easy for someone to talk to the prime minister like that uh, so he yeah. did not hold back his views he did uh, yeah. he did sound out the views but he he was also a practical man he was a businessman he knew that he had to run the business so he he found ways to manage uh the system and to find ways to to ensure that the businesses ran uh you know he continued to provide employment um so it 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 was a it was a you know a a a a, a, a tight rope walk that he did well not and only everybody did that every entrepreneur did that at that time but he was very uh, you know Uh, astute at that point of time because he also uh, was in fact one of the few first uh, businessmen who started with the corporate social responsibility and also uh, he uh, made his father uh, get an insurance for his flour mill as well right yeah 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 so you know the uh, again as i did my research it uh, it was apparent that the modi household was a deeply religious household so gujar yeah. mal he had grown up uh you know with uh, uh, a prayer meeting in the morning a prayer meeting in the evening and you know bhajans and satyanarayan ki kathas and you know all those stories being told in the in the house uh, uh vrat rakhe jate the so he he followed all of that so uh philanthropy was an active part of religiosity so his father was philanthropic his grandfather was philanthropic so he saw acts of uh, good deeds being done while growing up i mean 
he himself also indulged in these even when he was a child. So he grew up seeing this and uh, therefore when he was on his own, he did set aside 10% uh, of the income from all the businesses and plowed it back into social uh, response. I mean, it, what we call CSR now. Mm -hmm. uh, but this 10% is interesting because, you know, in uh, the six, there is something called the Dasan. The Dasan the is 10% of the income is kept for, uh, for, for charity. So mm -hmm. he'd grown up in Patiala. I think he carried that bit of Patiala with him uh, to Modinagar. And he kept aside 10% uh, and he built, I mean, there's a list of, I think, 150 uh, 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 organizations and institutions and uh, uh, what, what do you call them, uh, rest houses and there's like you know, mandirs all built by uh, Gujar Mal Modi and the tradition was then carried forward by his children. That's quite a lot, in fact. That's quite a lot. I mean, today we crib about 2% of yeah. and here it was 10% of the revenue. Yes. Uh, in fact, uh, talking about revenues, uh, he did not see a lot of losses in his, uh, you know, uh, in his uh, business and his career span, except for maybe 1934 and 1952. So how did he cope up with that? What was the lesson for him? And also, like, you know, from him, if uh, young uh, entrepreneurs can take some lesson out of it, what would that be? So, you know, when you talk of uh, making profits, uh, you need to remember that it was a very different India. Uh, manufacturing was not as big as it is today. Uh, a lot of stuff wasn't manufactured in India, a lot of stuff was imported. And therefore, if an entrepreneur got a product right, got the factory right, got his costings right, uh, you know, profits were a byproduct of that. So he, except for that initial, when he set up the sugar mill, you know, there, there was one year of loss. And then, you know, when there was a, a fall in the commodity prices and he was caught at the wrong side of it, there was a loss. So he hadn't seen too much of losses. That's because he ran his business. It is a, It was a family business. He ran his business like a family. I mean, his workers uh, worshipped him because he was he was a tough taskmaster but he was also an empathetic boss so you know when you have that balance of empathy with uh, with discipline uh, uh, he, the and he, and he gave the workers houses to live in in modinagar every time he built a factory uh, simultaneously a workers colony was built with roads with uh, uh, with trees, with parks, with temples, with schools, with dispensaries. So, you know, the workers were happy to be part of the Modi uh, group. It was a, I mean, Modi Nagar was a thriving city. It was a very vibrant city. Uh, it's unfortunate that after his death, it kind of degenerated. Uh, but in its heydays, it was a very vibrant city, full of life, full of people. So he, he, he managed that, he managed his people uh, in uh, with empathy, but with strict discipline. He was quite a family man uh, himself as well. And uh, in fact, uh, you also in the book uh, speak about how two women influenced, uh, had a lot of influence on him. One is the mother and also the wife, uh, if you could tell about his family and his softer side. Yeah. So, you know, uh, like they say that behind every successful man is a woman. So I think in his case, there were two women, uh, his stepmother and his wife. So he, uh, you know, Gujamal's um, mother was actually a stepmother, yeah. but she, uh, she kind of overcompensated in terms of love, affection. And also, you know, what we say, shiksha jo milti hai ghar mein. So she was, a, she was a very strong influence on uh, young Gujarmal. And then his wife, uh, you know, uh, she was also, I mean, she was a young girl uh, uh, who was married to him. This was his second uh, shadi. And he, but she was an intelligent girl and she became the pillar of support for her husband and she became 
an equal partner, not you know as an equal partner in business, but in everything that uh, the business did, and also all the CSR, what we call the CSR activities. So she was she was an active active part of his life, which again was a very uh, which was which was not something that many the women were kind of kept in the background, but she was not part of the business but everything else uh, she was she was part of it uh, she brought up her children she gave them the right shiksha uh, she, uh, she she was she took care of the house and also all the other uh, other csr i you know for want of a better word i would say csr and uh, in the beginning of our uh, interaction, uh, you said that, you know, you decided to write about uh, him first because there are certain entrepreneurs who are quite forgotten. Uh, why do you think such entrepreneurs are not remembered the way they should be remembered and only a few handful of entrepreneurs are always remembered? Yeah, so, uh, you know, Purva, this has to do with this whole uh, structure of family businesses. And as, as I study family, so let me just first give you a more general answer and then I'll come to the specific. So, you know, 80% of world commerce today is in the hands of family owned businesses. I mean, 80% is a very, very large percent. So some of them are also family run. The others are run by professionals. 70% of all family businesses last only one generation. Uh, only 3% of all family businesses make it to the fourth generation and beyond. And the reason for this high drop off at every generational change has nothing to do with business. It has nothing to do with, you know, what products, what factories, what mills you have. It has everything to do with the family. So now okay. while there is a whole dobi list, laundry list of all the issues that happen in any family business, the key ones are lack of succession planning right conflict uh, inability to manage conflict refusal to see the difference between ownership and management uh, refusal to let go by the patriarch uh, inability to accept external talent so these are these are some of the reasons why family businesses fail to become uh, multi generational ones so if you look at list of successful businesses in 1947 and then look at successful businesses, say the top 20 in 1960 and then 1990 and then in 2010, you'll see there are just a ha maybe three or four names that, you know, remain constant in uh, each of the list. There are new names that come up. So, you know, in the olden days, you used to have large families, you know, three sons, five sons, six sons, eight sons, and the business used to be divided between the sons. And uh, if the families were unable to manage this, uh, 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 the inter-family dynamics of intra-family dynamics of the larger, larger family, but the inter-family dynamics between the inheritors, the casualty is always the business. Whenever there is conflict in the family, which is not managed, the casualty is always the business. And therefore, if I look and, you know, when we are looking at other entrepreneurs who had set up large business empires, uh, they're almost forgotten uh, today because their inheritors haven't been able to preserve the legacy as a whole. Individually, the inheritors are doing well. So even in Gujarman Modi's case, individually, his sons, five sons, now four, uh, you know, they're doing, each one of them has a successful business group, but mm -hmm. they're separate. Now, imagine if all of them were together, uh, the Modi enterprise would be one of India's largest business enterprises. So yeah. uh, when we decided to bring out this series of entrepreneurs who built India, the attempt is to bring back the spotlight on those entrepreneurs who built these successful large businesses. But over the years, uh, you know, the, the businesses do not exist in the manner that they were. Hmm. And, uh, you know, in conclusion, 
uh, would you like to tell us how many books will you write uh, in this particular series and which is the next one that we can expect from you now so i won't uh, tell you about the next one because i'm in the middle of writing it and i okay uh, uh, when can we expect that i'm sorry when can we expect it to come out then yeah so the attempt or the 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 uh, the objective is to try and pick up one entrepreneur every year and okay. write about him and i'm saying him because there were very few hers <laughs> at that time i'm still looking for one her uh yeah. you know, in pre independent india if you know of any please do let me know yes uh, even our viewers can probably help if you know you can please write in the comment uh, and probably help so no find the her or uh, find a her but otherwise i am going to write about him uh, so each each year we plan to pick up one entrepreneur and write about him do the research and write about him but you know the uh, you know in conclusion what i do want to say is that you know when we hear entrepreneurs today youngsters today cribbing about itna mushkil hai kaam karna and you know it's so difficult. and the government doesn't let us work and this doesn't let us work and that doesn't let us work you know they should actually read about these people who mm-hmm. conquered all odds set up large businesses set up large factories and gave employment to thousands of people and took care of the workers build workers colonies you know gave them free medicine gave them free uh, education i think there's a lot to learn from the people of entrepreneurs of that age yeah absolutely that's why it is a learning uh, process for any entrepreneur or a startup uh, you know want to uh, take out a startup and please read these books uh, as uh, sonu said she will come up with one entrepreneur each year so that's quite exciting so uh, it's lovely talking to you it has been lovely experience talking to you uh, sonu and we wish you all the best and congratulations on this book so thank you for joining us on soft cover at the print thank you purva it was a pleasure for me as well and thank you for having me on your show